before I uh, give the closing presentation for this group, uh, I'll just say a few things in Arabic. Uh, uh, our colleague, Bila uh, Pabovic, in her presentation, she quoted uh, uh, Muhammad Iqbal. And uh, the wish, Taban, is based on the assumption that uh, we are all familiar with uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يقول لنا دعوني وإني قريب مجيب الدعوات and uh, that was part of the English quotation اللي كانت عن قدامكم ولكن هل الدعوات لوحدها كافية عشان نغير نظام التعليم العالمي لا عايزين جهدكم جميعا ونشاطكم جميعا معنا وده الحقيقة التحدي الكبير إنما المهم إنه واضح من الكلام بتاع الورد يونيفرسي كونسورتيوم إنه الاهتمام والشعور العالمي باحتياج لثورة تعليمية شاملة موجود وإن زي ما قالت في قادة قادة التعليم والفكر في شتى أنحاء العالم قدروا انهم اجتمعوا في بيركلي وغيرها معترفين بحاجه لهذا التغيير والسؤال الى اين نحن ذاهبون. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'll come back now to uh, talking a little bit about what sort of a university. We know what the objectives are, but what sort of a university. So I will just remind you that yesterday I covered the seven pillars of the knowledge revolution and that these provide the context for the future of the university. But the cultural mission of the pursuit of knowledge will continue and it will require that we rethink the institutions themselves that serve the knowledge. We need to reinvent education. Our education system is not optimal. In fact, it's terrible. Children like to run and play and shout. And what is the first thing we do when they come to school? We tell them to sit still and be quiet. The first mother is Muslim. And it is, uh, now the question, of course, and they have to obey an authority figure. You think this is a cartoon? It is the real thing. So what are we doing? Well, we are teaching them to be drilled and do boring stuff again and again, listening to an authority figure and to be docile. And in the United States, children who do not obey this system are considered problem children. And they even give them medicines because they have attention deficit disorder. So what is the result? The result is bored primary school students, Bored high school students, bored in college, and the net result of that is that learning in many universities is drilling people to deliver docile workers to a system where they do boring, repetitive tasks. Now we know from great artists like Charlie Chaplin that this can be dehumanizing, but it's okay, it goes on. Why? Because our economy in the last 150 years needed workers who would be like that. And that's what employers looked for in a degree. And this is why our economy wanted, not only in factories, but also in offices. And we ended up with bored office workers. But the economy is changing. And the question is, what is this new economy? Robots. Robots are going to take over all these repetitive tasks. In automobiles, we already have seen this enormous transformation of the assembly lines. And this is two graphs which are very simple. This is the cost per unit of human labor. See the direction is going. This is the cost per unit of robot labor. Human labor, robot labor. 
where do you think the investments are going to go for these kinds of repetitive jobs? Robots. In fact, they are doing many of the boring repetitive tasks already. And last week, the Economist gave a special survey on the rise of the robots. And this is where they are. This is industrial robots per 10,000 employees in manufacturing and South Korea, Japan, Germany, Sweden, etc. And this is the total stock of robots. More important is what you see down here. You all know we had an enormous collapse of the Western economies, if not the global economy, in 2008, 2009. So there was a drop here. But you also know that the, uh, the post-recession, there was very little job opportunities. But look at what happened in robot demands. This is the number of robots. So when people came out of the recession, they were not recreating the old jobs, they were transforming things again. So we have to deal not with immigrants from the south to the north, we have to deal with immigrants from the future who are coming here. It's not the future is here already. So why do we continue to drill our kids in yesterday's skills? That is the question. We need to transform education, in reinvent education in terms of content, method, participants, and organizational setting. On content, of course, the internet is going to be a fundamental part of that. Electronic books are the future. Digitization is underway. This was already the first bookless library created in San Antonio, Texas School of Engineering, 425,000 books, 18,000 journals. They removed everything from the shelves. The future is unstoppable. The upside, of course, is as I told you yesterday, the librarian's dream. We can put at your fingertips all the knowledge of the world. This is the first time we have the technology to do this. And although some are still hoping that books will be here to stay, things have changed. And you young people are already showing us the way. And if the older people are saying, how can he read that way, not holding a book? I say to my colleagues in the ancient library and thereafter, there must have been also a time when the same situation was. People looked at the invention of the codex, which is the book, and said, how can he read that way? Because people used to write and read in scrolls. So, khalas, kullu hayba elektroni. Kullu elektronik in the future. You'll be able to download and move on with it. But the method of teaching, instruction, somebody standing on a blackboard. That's been the standard way of doing it. Now there's a little more guided learning, which is distance learning, courses, MOOCs, etc. But a lot of self-learning is in the future. And you should be able to redesign yourself, not only the scoring systems and so on, but the kind of curriculum that you want. And we try to do this in the Library of Alexandria in information literacy classes to encourage you to think of what if. Who are the participants? The same participants as before, parents, teachers, students, peer groups, community, and the media, especially the internet. The only difference is that peer groups and community now will constitute a real and a virtual. Because there are virtual people you are communicating with through your Facebook, through other things, who are not physically next to you. And that will be a new phenomenon that we will deal with. We have seen a benefit whereby instead of the teacher teaching in the classroom as traditionally and then giving homework for people to do on their own time, to do problem solving and so on on their own time, no. That the lecturing part is done on video and then the face time is done for problem solving and mentoring by the teachers. And in fact, What's very useful in that model is that kids help each other to learn. And anybody who doubts that should see how they teach each other how to play video games very quickly. Organizational setting, schools will still be necessary for socialization, continuing study, healthy lifestyle choices, forming households, becoming active citizens, entering the labor force, these five great transitions 
occur between high school, end of high school, and end of university. And that socialization function is very important. So what can I say about the university of the future? Very quickly, in less than five minutes, 10 major features of the university of the future. One, it cannot be something alone out there. It has to be part of this reinvented education system that covers all of these aspects. And uh, because education has to be unified and integrated, not just the usual K-12 part, but all the way through doctorates and postdoctorates. It is part already of a changed higher education landscape. Models of higher education have hardly changed in the last 150 years. These very elite schools continue to function as they did, but many institutions will have to become modular, lifelong learning uh, institutions because people will be coming back and living on campus as well. We talked about massive online open courses, and these are just the beginning. We are seeing the seeds of the future, as was said. So what we have now is not where we are going, it is just the beginning. And the great universities have already been actually responding very rapidly to this and creating consortiums to try to deal with that and have met with us in uh, Berkeley and in other places to discuss this. The, open, the idea of the open university is not new. The UK's open university is now already over 40 years old. So it's nothing revolutionary. We have examples. 40 years ago, they started the open university system in the UK. So the new enters are, systems are now entering the mainstream. Carlos Slim is paying to translate a lot of the MOOCs and educational materials of the Salman Khan Academy into Spanish. And in that sense, the university and society will continue to play a major interactive role as we translate things into our languages, get busier, society moving ever faster. The community and the uh, university will play a role, but the university through teaching and research of principles plays a more important role than just imparting skills. In the economy, the universities will continue to do scientific excellence in research. We talked about that yesterday, so I will not come to it. But the technology we know is based on these intellectual clusters and industrial clusters. The core functions of the university will remain the pursuit of truth, the socialization function, and what used to be the certification function based on an old system where you could get a degree and then function for 40 years will be retired because the jobs themselves are being transformed. We must change the certification function as continuing lifelong education will be required. So they will become nodes of networks of learning and experience where the universities will be the hub of that. Provide continuing education, yes. Do research, yes. But forming new students, new generations of students will still be the functions of the university. It will probably have a fundamental foundation followed by more self-learning and guided learning, an enormous amount of modular teaching for lifelong education, and a lot of offerings. The curricula for tomorrow will have that foundation plus specialization in a particular field, but learning to work with others across disciplines. Remember, again, the seven pillars I presented yesterday, pluridisciplinarity was one of them. And you will have lots and lots of electives. As when you come now, you can find all the books you want Right here in the library, we have over 70,000 journals, journal titles, 70,000. There isn't a subject in the world that you cannot come and find material uh, in the best journals of that subject. So that will continue with us. Seventh, the governance of the university has to change. And oh, if you look at governance structure, uh, there's a lot of things that go into governance. The juridical status of the university, the clarity of its mission, relationship with other social actors. If you think of that, what really counts is giving a role to each of these, the students, the faculty, the administration, the community, the parents, the government, the financiers, and the industry, and maintaining the autonomy of the institution, which was one of the items I discussed yesterday as well. Now, the juridical status of the university is not important. We can see excellence in both public and private institutions. 
17 of the top 20 universities are American as ranked. You can see them here in red. But Harvard, for example, is a private institution. Berkeley is a public institution. They're always number one, number two, it doesn't matter. So the question is not whether it's public or private, it is whether it is good. And you can be good when you're public and you can be good when you're private. The clarity of the mission plays a role to understand the interlinkage of these three functions I've described. The relationship with other actors in the community is important to be not just something on paper but something real. Now we come to the business model. That's another story. The community of scholars of the past has to be maintained but transformed. Debate and discussion that involves all the actors, the students, the parents, and so on, has got to be real. And the decision-making structure has to give a role to each of these, maintaining the autonomy we talked, in a form of transparency, responsibility, and accountability. But what about the business model? Well, some people are talking about future employers as customers, student skills as products, teachers as workers, administration as managers. Wrong. I think it's a dangerous model and it should not be used. People are much more than products. Skills are more than products. We have to talk about human beings, interaction, society. And International Association of Universities highlights that in the functions of the right to pursue knowledge for its own sake, to follow wherever the search of truth may lead, to tolerate divergent opinions, and to be free from political interference. But in our societies, we want the values we talk about have to include our identity, our heritage, our past. So we are custodians of the past heritage and the socialization of students to these values but we are also the incubators of the new. So you are custodians of the past and incubators of the new. So we have to honor the past, celebrate the present, and invent the future, emphasizing the continuation of values, and to use the values to become the modernizing force in our society as we are changing it, and we see the drive for democracy that has been driven in Egypt and in the Arab world by young people in the revolution that started on the 25th of January and in the 30th of June. So it's not just about money. It's not just what do you get and what can you earn out of it. We talk of the knowledge-based society, but knowledge is more than information. Data, when organized, becomes information. Information, when explained, becomes knowledge. But we need more. We need wisdom. And wisdom is not just information organized. It is about thinking beyond what is there. We need the insight of the social sciences and the wisdom of the humanities. And recognizing universal values such as these, to which I would add the love of nature and the appreciation of the arts, values about community and caring, values about critical thinking and rationality, and the values of science which I described yesterday as truth, honor, creativity, constructive subversiveness, and the arbitration of disputes by evidence. All of these are important. My last piece of advice on founding the University of the Future is it's a journey, not a destination. You have to keep changing the plans. Change is happening with incredible speed. Whatever you do, even if you choose to be a niche or boutique institution, you will have to change the way in which you present your services. And so, whether we feel comfortable with it or not, the implications of all of these knowledge revolutions are immense. The universities of tomorrow are being invented in our minds today, this very instant. We are bounded only by the imagination that we can bring. Now, the World University Consortium is intended to broaden the horizons and bring the best thinkers in the world together to work with you and with others on how to think about that future. So let us all dare to dream and to be bold, for it is the dawn of a new age, and let us embrace it. Thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Faham, you have an announcement to make, as usual. <laughs> ah, that... Coffee break is outside. Okay, that's the only announcement? Okay, coffee break is outside. <laughs>